brown book of the hitler terror by lord marley chapter nine the concentration camps part one on the basis of statements published in the press the total number of political prisoners in hitler's germany at the beginning of june nineteen thirty three must be put at about sixty to seventy thousand of this total between thirty five and forty thousand men and women have been taken to concentration camps it goes without saying that there is no legal justification for the establishment of concentration camps there are no laws or regulations determining the rights of prisoners in concentration camps nor is there any law or regulation governing the length of their detention in the camps till our leader takes pity on them the neue zurcher zeitung in an article on the concentration camps in germany published on may eighth nineteen thirty three states that the prisoners will be divided into two groups those whom it is easy and those whom it is difficult to train as citizens and that the former will be kept in the camps one year the latter three years but this is merely the personal opinion of the reporter not an official statement banishment to the concentration camps and also the length of the period of detention are entirely determined by the arbitrary will of the fascist chiefs central and local lieutenant kaufmann one of the nazi controllers of the concentration camp at heuberg in baden put the position very clearly in an interview which he gave at the end of april to a reporter of the danish paper politiken in reply to the question how long will you keep the prisoners here the lieutenant replied quote, till our leader takes pity on them End quote. the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april thirtieth nineteen thirty three confirms this statement by lieutenant kaufmann in so far as it says quote, it will be a long while before many of the prisoners get their freedom for the will of the prisoners is not easy to break End quote. if i even knew why i am here the men and women who have been interned in the concentration camps are completely innocent even within the meaning of the principle of the fascist state all socialist and communist workers and leaders who in the government's view have done anything against the laws of the fascist regime are not put into the concentration camps but are locked up in prisons and penal settlements and brought before special courts and sentenced the people who are interned in the concentration camps are only men and women whose political views are regarded by the fascists as suspect though even the fascist prosecutors cannot find any pretext for a criminal prosecution against them most of them were arrested immediately after the burning of the reichstag and the elections on march fifth so that they could not conceivably have carried on any activity hostile to the fascist regime towards the end of april the politiken published some letters from prisoners in concentration camps one young worker writes if i only knew why i am here a doctor writes only anonymous and personal revenge can be the reason for my imprisonment another man writes i have nothing to reproach myself with i have no idea why i was arrested the trivial things which suffice to bring people into the concentration camps are well illustrated by the case of the jewish religious teacher karl krebs who is a citizen of czechoslovakia and has been in germany since he was a year old the following order was issued for his arrest Quote, the jewish teacher of religion karl krebs of dinkelsbuhl a czechoslovakian subject is to be arrested on march twenty ninth nineteen thirty three 
Krebs killed some hens, creating great dissatisfaction among the population. Although this was not a criminal act, in view of the great excitement among the population in connection with the atrocity campaign of the Jews abroad, Krebs should not have carried out such an act. The excitement among the population is so great that Krebs must be put under arrest in order to protect him from attacks. The order for his protective arrest is issued in agreement with the Commissioner Burgomaster Itemeyer in Wasser Trudigen, Dinkelsbühl, March 29, 1933. Krebs is still in prison what the concentration camps are for captain buck nazi chief of the hoiberg concentration camp told the reporter of the politiken that the purpose of the concentration camps was quote, to punish the prisoners end quote. in some of the camps as prisoners who have been released report the prisoners have to register as convict x in accordance with the regulations for penal settlements their heads have even been shaved the london daily telegraph of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three confirms this in a cable from its vienna correspondent r g Gede. the convicts have not seen a judge and will not see one the national socialist leaders have repeatedly stated that internment in the concentration camps is a purely administrative measure that it is a question of protective detention the nazis told the politiken correspondent quote, we have had to intern many of these individuals in order to protect them from the vengeance of the people they would have been lynched by the patriotic mob who regard these criminals as the instigators of the november revolution End quote. this statement is an outright lie the extraordinarily strict watch on the camps is not for the sake of protecting the interned socialists and communists the machine guns in front of the camps are to make any attempts at flight or rescue impossible wherever there have been so-called demonstrations against arrested persons the tumult and rioting has been organized by the fascists the transfer of the former social democratic minister Ramelli to a concentration camp which was organized as a great popular entertainment shows this clearly the volkischer beobachter of may seventeenth nineteen thirty three published the following report headed in the pillory Quote, on tuesday the former state president and minister Dr. Adam Ramelli, recently president of the German Consumers Purchasing Cooperative Society in Hamburg, who a few days ago was brought from there to Karlsruhe at the request of the government, was taken in an open police car from the prison at the western end of the town to the office of the chief of police. With Ramelli were also Stenz, whom he had placed in the Ministry of the Interior the former baden councillor and member of the reichstag marum the editor of the karlsruhe social democratic paper volksfreund grunenbaum the former police commissioner fuhrer and the baden leaders of the reichsbanner and the iron front as well as other members of the social democratic party from the police headquarters they were then taken to a penal settlement at kieslaw now a concentration camp a gigantic crowd had assembled outside the prison and greeted the prisoners with jeers and catcalls a double row of nazi protective corpsmen marched with linked arms in front of the first police car on which the prisoners were seated bareheaded to clear the street a second police car followed the first filled with stormtroopers the procession was also flanked by stormtroopers and others brought up the rear the police cars drove quite slowly through a double wall of onlookers often eight deep catcalls and abuse greeted the prisoners all the way along the streets 
the song of the miller was also sung everywhere by way of mocking ramelle who had once been a miller's laborer and had forbidden the singing of this song in baden the procession passed in front of the diet buildings and the government offices as well as the former trade union building at each of which a short halt was made along the way bands also played the song of the miller the concourse was so immense that the whole of the tramway and motor traffic was stopped a number of persons who shouted red front were arrested on the spot and taken along in the second police car End quote. the report shows clearly that this was an organized demonstration with carefully prepared shouting in short that it was one of those spectacles which the reich minister of propaganda goebbels uses to entertain the crowd and to make it for a while forget its hunger protective arrest protective detention in germany is strictly governed by the law of eighteen forty nine on the restriction of personal freedom by this law only persons who are themselves threatened may be taken into protective arrest this must not be continued longer than is necessary for the purpose and in no case longer than three months the law provides for the lodging of appeals and a decision by the courts but all those who are now imprisoned were arrested not in their own interest but to protect the new rulers they are being kept longer than three months and they have no right to appeal forty five concentration camps how many concentration camps are there and how many people are detained in them the german government probably with good reason avoids giving any exact information on the basis of a few reports in the german press occasional statements by nazi leaders and visits of foreign journalists it is possible to draw the conclusion that early in july nineteen thirty three there were forty five concentration camps with between thirty five thousand and forty thousand prisoners the following are some of the camps dachau near munich bavaria five thousand prisoners heuberg upper baden two thousand prisoners Kislau, near buchsal baden one hundred prisoners rostadt baden three hundred prisoners bad durheim baden five hundred prisoners waltz two thousand prisoners mulheim rhine two thousand prisoners hohenstein saxony eight hundred prisoners ortenstein zwickau saxony two hundred prisoners zittau saxony three hundred prisoners ordwurf thuringia twelve hundred prisoners oranienburg near berlin fifteen hundred prisoners sonnenburg prussia four hundred and fourteen prisoners senelager potterbern nine hundred men thirty women esterwagen westphalia five hundred prisoners vilsede lunenberger heide two thousand prisoners Königstein, Saxony, two hundred prisoners. A concentration camp at Papenburg, Emsland, has been equipped for four thousand prisoners. Other camps are at Ginsheim and Rodelheim, near Frankfurt, Langen and Osthofen in Hessen, Kassel, Fulsbüttel and Wittmore near Hamburg, Bremen, Braunschweig grundal near konigsberg and another in east prussia schleswig pomerania breslau there are six camps in brandenburg province five in the ruhr area and a number in central germany the number of prisoners in these camps is not known in the middle of may the government decided to open ten new concentration camps the frankfurter zeitung of may thirtieth nineteen thirty three reports that a second concentration camp 
will be opened at Hoiburg for such prisoners as are not to be released before the winter. Women and Intellectuals in the Camps There are hundreds of women among the prisoners in the concentration camps. The communist women members of the Reichstag and of the state diets, insofar as they were found, were first taken to the women's prison in the Barnumstrasse in Berlin, before they were taken to the concentration camp. This prison has been organized as a collecting and transit station for arrested women. Early in June, a special concentration camp for women was organized in South Germany. An official announcement dated June 8, 1933, states, quote, A detention camp for women has been organized at Gotzel near Gomund in Württemberg. End quote. A second concentration camp for women was opened in Saxony a few days later. All reports agree that the women in the prisons and concentration camps are being subjected to exceptionally bad treatment and persecution. All kinds of views and professions and ages are represented among the prisoners in the concentration camps. Communists, anarchists, social democrats, adherents of the center party pacifists jews young and old people workers intellectuals artists students members of parliamentary bodies lawyers doctors writers tradesmen well-known names and unknown names martin buber the gray-haired zionist poet karl von osietzky the revolutionary pacifist editor of the Weltbühne, the anarchist Eric Musam, the Bavarian member of parliament, Auer, the democratic member of the Reichstag, Fischer, the social democrat members of the Reichstag, Rossmann and Pfluger, the barrister Hans Litten, the doctors Schmidtke and Bernheim, and many others of similar standing the truth breaks through the hitler government has done its best to conceal the conditions in the concentration camps the committee for the victims of fascism has nevertheless succeeded in obtaining from prisoners who have succeeded in getting away and from relatives of prisoners a considerable amount of material which throws light on the terrible condition of the prisoners in the concentration camps in spite of the nazi guards and barbed wire the truth has broken through to the outside world foreign journalists have been allowed to see some of the model camps such as those at hoiberg dachau and oranienburg nazi stormtroopers accompanied the press representatives everywhere there was no opportunity of separate conversation with any of the prisoners the descriptions given by these correspondents are therefore general impressions of the arrangement of the camps rather than observations of actual conditions but where the journalists were able even though in a very restricted way to describe the objective conditions or where as in the case of edmund taylor of the chicago daily tribune they were able to put a few questions to prisoners in a foreign language the truth also comes to light in the newspaper reports anyone who wants to help get the truth about the german concentration camps must support the demand for an international commission of members of all the relief committees to have the right to visit every camp not under the control of the commandants of the camps and of nazi guards but to make their visits without warning, with the right to investigate conditions in every detail and to talk to every prisoner without interference. The convict prisons of Sonnenburg and Fusbüttel were closed down some years ago because they were buildings belonging to the Middle Ages and were absolutely unhygienic from a modern standpoint even habitual criminals were no longer sent there in fulbutel there are no closets and no drains 
detention in this prison is acute torture particularly in the hot part of the year but these are the prisons which the hitler government has now established as concentration camps among the prisoners at sonnenburg are litten kasper Asietsky, and mulsum the concentration camp at zittau was formerly a bookshop so that the comforts of this camp can be imagined the concentration camp at dachau according to a report in the daily telegraph of april twenty fifth nineteen thirty three consists of old half decayed huts Oranienburg is the model camp which has been shown to a number of foreign journalists and of which the nazis have broadcast photographs an abandoned factory formerly a brewery the works have fallen into ruin the windows are simply broken glass the yard is covered with grass and weeds this is how the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april thirtieth nineteen thirty three describes oranienburg we are in possession of a confidential report from a german woman journalist who accompanied a foreign correspondent as interpreter when he visited the camp at oranienburg Quote, only one single pump in the courtyard the prisoners of whom there are between one hundred and two hundred have to wash in five old wash basins which stand in the courtyard the rooms where they sleep are old workshops which are in ruins a few inches of dirty straw cover the cement floor End quote. the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april thirtieth nineteen thirty three confirms that the prisoners have to sleep on straw in dachau according to the description given by gide in the daily telegraph of april twenty fifth nineteen thirty three fifty four prisoners sleep in a small hut on rough wooden boards covered with straw the interpreter who has already been mentioned describes the appalling conditions in such a dormitory at oranienburg Quote, already by evening when the prisoners are locked in the place stinks as if a herd of wild animals had spent the night there but it is impossible to describe the air after it has been slept in by fifty or more men whose clothes are unwashed and whose sweating bodies fill the room with vapor End quote. the model camp at heuberg the concentration camp at heuberg is the show place among the camps it is exhibited to all foreign reporters who for the most part describe the external appearance of the camp and its environment but do not deal with the internal rooms and dormitories at the end of may the frankfurter zeitung published a detailed report on a visit to the heuberg camp which testifies to the extremely close guard kept on the prisoners and the military drill imposed on them the young nazis are forbidden to enter into conversation with prisoners owing to the fear that they might be influenced politically the report runs quote, the old parade ground is now used as a concentration camp going in through a lattice fence we could see the whole camp spread out before us first there are the offices a post office and the officials quarters with little gardens then left and right the former quarters of the Reichswehr soldiers here at a height of twenty seven hundred feet where there is little green to be seen two thousand prisoners are herded together in small rooms the houses are shut in by iron railings tall barbed wire fences run round the buildings in a double line so that there is a space between them the concentration camp is divided into sections the stormtroopers are on guard with rifles by the iron railings both sides of the barbed wire fences are guarded by auxiliary police the windows are empty it is forbidden to look out at night searchlights play on the sides of the building each building is divided into two sections a and b 
there is one latrine between them and the courtyard left and right of the staircase on each floor are large rooms and between them the former sergeant major's room now labeled control officers there are three of these one storm troop officer for each of the large rooms and a police sergeant who maintains contact with the police officer in charge at the entrance to the prisoner's room there is a register containing the names of the thirty-six prisoners name place of birth address the storm troop officer pulls out his key we hear look out shouted inside and the voices in the room are silent chairs are pushed back the prisoners rise to their feet when the control officer enters the prisoners sit on little stools at long smooth tables playing chess they have made the pieces themselves there are practically no papers or books to be seen each room is provided with one newspaper which is usually read aloud by someone there are small square cupboards along the wall in which eating utensils are kept while the young nazi auxiliary police all of whom come from the countryside are forbidden to have any dealings with the prisoners the nazi officers are charged with the duty of bringing their political influence to bear on the prisoners in the room under their control correspondence is controlled by the officials each prisoner can write a letter or card once a fortnight the officer in charge has to determine from these letters the general conduct of the prisoners and official and private conversations with them which of the prisoners show any prospect of changing their political views End quote. we can supplement this report with information given us in a letter from the heuberg camp the writer's name cannot be disclosed for the reason that he is still in the camp quote, there are two thousand comrades in heuberg most of them communists they are kept in seven or eight two-story buildings each double block and single block are separated off by barbed wire fences two meters high in rooms twelve meters by eight thirty men are housed in the top rooms four to twelve men according to the size of the rooms the beds in two tiers consist of a straw sack and two blankets there are no baths the reporter of de telegraph the amsterdam paper says in a report of april fifth that the prisoners get a bath once a month evidently this does not apply to all prisoners the editors soap is not provided anyone who wants it must buy it linen is not provided and there is no washing towels are in short supply one between two prisoners open razors are forbidden shaving is difficult so beards are becoming the latest achievement of the german awakening End quote. captain buck who is in control of the camp told the politiken reporter that heuberg is not a sanatorium either in comfort or in hygiene he is right these camps are breeding grounds of disease and but few will leave them sound the guards round the camp the prisoners in the camps are kept under extraordinarily strict control nazi stormtroopers are patrolling everywhere armed with rubber truncheons rifles and revolvers many of the patrols are accompanied by police dogs the official photographs show this it is confirmed by the politiken the telegraph and the daily telegraph and by every prisoner's letters in the daily telegraph of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three gede reports that the concentration camp at dachau is surrounded by a high wire fence which is charged with high voltage electricity machine guns are kept ready at the main posts the correspondence of the telegraph and politiken were struck by the mass of barbed wire and railings from which escape was impossible at night the camp is lighted up by gigantic searchlights the light prevents the prisoners from sleeping 
the telegraph of april fifth nineteen thirty three says quote, if any one opens a window to get a breath of air he is shot at end quote. the camp at oranienburg has low factory walls on one side and on the other where the prisoners take exercise quite low shrubbery do none of the prisoners try to get away the journalist who visited the camp with a foreign correspondent put this question the reply quote, there is no danger of flight here the guards are armed and have strict instructions to shoot at once if any of the prisoners cross the boundary marked by the bushes besides why should they try to get away things are all right for them here even when they are allowed to go they don't want to End quote. the questioner quote, but that is impossible Unquote. the reply quote, the day before yesterday we received instructions to set one man free he would not go and had to be taken to the station by force ask the others whether this is so or not End quote. the journalist continues her report quote, it is a fact that there have been cases of prisoners not wanting their liberty but why the orders for release come as a rule at night or at a very early hour of the morning at that time it is easier to shoot a prisoner on the way and then the following day the papers report marxist shot when trying to escape End quote in fact these low bushes are meant to tempt prisoners to flight but flight means death grouping of prisoners the arbitrary decisions which have brought the concentration camps into being have also divided the prisoners into three categories a easily reformable german nationals barbarian guards and political followers b not easily reformable c unreformable communist leaders and officials and intellectuals of left views are put in the last category and the worst treatment is meted out to them in the report on the heuberg camp which has already been quoted this fact is confirmed quote, prisoners who on the basis of documents and reports are classified as unreformable are put into the old building numbers nineteen and twenty three there everything is much stricter the controlling officer does not have any conversation with them the time allowed for exercise is restricted to ten minutes permission to smoke and talk is given less frequently and they are not allowed to work which with the other prisoners gives the opportunity for a few hours of physical activity and entitles them to extra food end quote. the commandants of the camps compete with each other in inventing more and more ingenious punishments prisoners have their free time shortened permission to write letters is granted less often or taken away altogether they are not permitted to have visitors for a long period they are forbidden to take part in the general conversation during their free time they are isolated and particularly sharply controlled they are forbidden to smoke they are given long periods of arrest with only ten minutes exercise or are confined in a dark room disciplinary punishments which are frequently used are additional exercise continued for several hours drilling longer work hours and particularly unaccustomed and irritating work in some of the concentration camps prisoners against whom the nazis have a particular grudge have even been kept in chains according to the daily telegraph report of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three refractory prisoners for example at dachau are not allowed out of the tiny huts and may not go into the open air the report of the woman journalist already referred to describes a cell in the Oranienburg camp in which quote, not easily reformable unquote, prisoners are kept quote, a hole in the wall shut in by an iron door and without any other ventilation but the door we were shown one of these rooms empty 
but this was an hour after we had begun to inspect the camp so that evidently the prisoners had first been taken out then of the one hundred and twenty prisoners in the camp thirty were missing were they perhaps behind that iron door which we were not allowed to examine more closely at heuberg an elderly lawyer complained of the bad food for making this complaint he was condemned to sleep fifteen nights on the roof of the barracks without any shelter captain buck however assured the telegraph reporter april fifth nineteen thirty three that there were no detention cells in the heuberg camp manhandled and beaten all reports are unanimous on the fact that the unimprovable prisoners are being treated in such a way that their physical ruin is inevitable the aim is the physical extermination of the organizers of the german working class captain buck assured the representative of the politiken that no one was mishandled in the concentration camps quote, no blows no punishments end quote, he asserted but the government's press itself indicates that this is not true the angriff of april first writes quote, a reichsbanner man was interrogated he gave an insolent reply however a friendly but pointed look at his own rubber truncheon sufficed to bring home to him the seriousness of the position End quote. the maltreatment that must go on in this camp if a glance at a rubber truncheon is enough to bring home to a prisoner the seriousness of the position is confirmed by the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april thirtieth nineteen thirty three quote, for it was only by laying hold of them and carrying through the interrogation with merciless severity that we have succeeded in discovering the underground terror almost to its full extent but the resistance of individual prisoners has still to be broken End quote. this report confirms that torture is used in the interrogations we have a report of the correspondent of the chicago daily tribune edmund taylor he managed to speak in english and french with some of the prisoners in the heuberg camp so that the stormtroopers accompanying him did not know what was said many of the prisoners expressly stated that in that camp severe mishandling was a frequent occurrence similar reports come from the schloss ortenstein camp near Zwickau. visitors to this camp have declared on oath that they saw bleeding wheels and green and blue patches on the arms and hands of prisoners there can be no doubt whatever that these are the result of maltreatment the mishandling was particularly severe when the stormtroopers were in charge of the prisoners when they were replaced by police the position became more bearable but the stormtroopers have been put into the ortenstein camp again since the beginning of may End of chapter 9, part 1the hell of sonnenburg the concentration camp at sonnenburg must be dealt with separately letters and reports from prisoners and even official statements show beyond doubt that sonnenburg is a real torture chamber working-class leaders and intellectuals are subjected to the most disgraceful maltreatment throughout germany the camp is known as the sonnenburg hell a letter from a worker who escaped from sonnenburg gives a terrible description of the conditions there 
Quote, the first batches of prisoners were met at Sonnenburg Station by stormtroop detachments and police. They were compelled to sing and were literally beaten to the camp. The inhabitants of Sonnenburg can testify to this. When they arrived at the camp, the prisoners were compelled to stand in the courtyard in streaming rain. Then the first ones were taken to the rooms each had to fetch straw for himself from another floor stormtroopers were standing on the stairs and they beat the prisoners mercilessly with their rubber truncheons some were made to empty the closet pails of the nazis in the course of which they were again brutally mishandled one stormtrooper held a prisoner's head between his legs while another stormtrooper beat him the comrades were compelled to count the blows in a loud voice some of the prisoners received as many as one hundred and eighty-five blows in addition they were kicked and otherwise manhandled those treated worst were comrades litten wiener bernstein casper schneller and the jewish prisoners our old friend musem suffered terribly now things are a little different but instead we have extremely severe military drill worse than when i was a recruit most of the time we have to be exercising outside marching and singing the first three weeks were the worst in the single cells we were attacked in the night and terribly beaten the backs of many comrades were quite black i don't know whether lytton will get through with his life the wives of several of the Sonnenburg prisoners raised such sharp protests that Mittelbach, of the public prosecutor's department, was sent to Sonnenburg to investigate. Litten begged him to have him shot, as he could no longer bear the brutal mishandling that was being inflicted on him. End quote. The Sonnenburger Anzeiger of April 7, 1933, reported, quote, the prisoners had to march from the station to the former convict prison singing the national hymns the rubber truncheons of the berlin auxiliary police often helping them along End quote. this account by one of the sonnenburg prisoners is confirmed by letters from frau musam and frau kasper who visited their husbands in sonnenburg frau musam writes quote, they have beaten our husbands to the point of death eric i saw him and i did not recognize him teresa i did not recognize him among the others how they have been beaten they have cut off his beard and knocked out his teeth they made him carry his trunk he fell down on the road then the beasts beat him terribly as he lay on the road and could not get up when i reached sonnenburg there he was sitting completely broken and he was horrified that i had come his first words were how can you have come to this hell you won't get out alive they will kill you because you have seen us and how we have been mishandled when i saw casper i had to keep control of myself not to faint it was all the more ghastly as i had seen him three days before he was standing leaning against the wall his face white and absolutely mutilated there was blood running down from one eye which was quite blue to his mouth his mouth was black and swollen as if someone had stamped on his face he could hardly speak or move with the pains he had all over his body End quote the wives of the political prisoners bernstein and geisler succeeded in forcing the control authorities to grant them a permit to visit sonnenburg frau bernstein writes quote, i felt as if it was a stranger in front of me his eyes and the skin around them were blood red and badly swollen across his face there were broad wheels from blows with rubber truncheons i was not allowed to get close to him but his whole body must be battered during the whole time he stayed quite still in a strange position 
End quote. Frau Geisler writes, quote, When I saw my husband, he was so changed, and his face was so terribly swollen, that I had to keep myself in hand not to scream with horror. End quote. A prisoner who succeeded in escaping from Sonnenburg and getting over the German frontier reports, quote, There are 414 political prisoners in Sonnenburg, among them Karl von Ossietzky, who was arrested on February 28th. One of his fellow prisoners, who was 13 days in Sonnenburg and now has been able to get across the frontier, saw Ossietzky in the hospital ward bent double sunken features his face yellow his hands moving nervously shambling gait that is his description of ossietzky the other zonenborg prisoners dr wiener whose whole body had been beaten black and blue the communist bernstein whose kidneys have been injured by blows and who can now only walk with a crutch eric musom who with Caspar were forced to dig a grave for themselves, being told that they were to be shot the following morning. One night they broke the window of Caspar's cell and pushed a revolver through, threatening to shoot him. Then they rushed into his cell and beat him with rubber truncheons. The daily program in Sonnenburg is 5.15 a.m. Get up, empty the closets, there are no drains in Sonnenburg. Clean the cells, wash, exercise, etc. 8.30 a.m. Breakfast. 9 to 10. Military drill. Singing of Hitler songs. 10.30 until noon. Rest and dinner. 12.30 until 5.30 p.m. Military drill and gymnastics. 6 p.m. Supper. 6.30 until 7.30. Exercise. 7.30 until 8.30, free time, prisoners all together. End quote. The mishandling in the Zonenburg camp was so inhuman that the new police commander of the camp, appointed on April 11th, felt compelled to make a report on it to his superior officer. He received orders from above to destroy the copy of this letter. Most of the pieces of this torn-up copy have come into our hands. Zonenburg, 18 May, 1933. Concerning certain occurrences since I took over the prison on 11 4, 1933. Quote, on taking up my post on the 11 4, 1933, I ascertained that no order was maintained in this prison, especially by the stormtroop men irregularities in the main concerned one treatment of prisoners by the stormtroop men two attitude of stormtroopers to the administration officials three conduct of stormtroopers among themselves four conduct of stormtroopers in public five the situation with regard to pay of the stormtroopers in regard to point one a section of the prisoners especially the prominent ones were extremely severely mishandled by members of the storm troops to put a stop to this mishandling the injured prisoners have been kept under control of word missing officers i threatened the storm troop men that if missing were repeated i would have the storm troopers kept under strict control day and night to put a stop to the missing on prisoners in spite of this, I have established two instances of prisoners being struck. In view of the way the stormtroopers support each other, especially in connection with such incidents, the investigations I set on foot proved fruitless. I have therefore threatened the stormtroopers that the slightest incident of this sort, again, will lead to my dismissing the guards on duty at the time, that is, the whole of the storm troop in regard to point two there is continuous conflict between the storm troop men and the administration officials on the question of pay in spite of reasonable advances against pay 
the stormtroop men feel that they are being prejudiced and they hold police inspector pells to blame their attitude toward police inspector pells was carried so far that only my personal intervention brought them to reason when the stormtroopers were withdrawn on the twenty fourth of april nineteen thirty three i had to place an armed police guard at pells's house to prevent any violence in regard to point three there were frequent conflicts among the stormtroop men generally over trivialities End quote. here the report breaks off compulsory labor the national socialist minister frick stated that the prisoners in the concentration camps were to be trained to become useful citizens in fact the work that they are forced to do is absolutely useless a neutral visitor to the oranienborg camp describes what he saw as follows quote, the work if we can call it work is the most pointless labor both for prisoners and warders that it is possible to imagine three young workers were driving six of their fellow unemployed to pull grass out of the ground as quickly as possible behind the factory building water is being splashed about some dozens of men are busy trying to clean the old building it is even worse where the wood is being cleared the trees have already been removed the prisoners under heavy guard are trying to dig out the gigantic roots with their fingers stormtroop men drive on workers who are old enough to be their grandfathers old sow red swine and so forth End quote. compulsory drill after the compulsory labor comes the compulsory drill according to official statements the time from one thirty to five thirty p m is allotted to drill this is severe military drill and military exercises of an extremely exhausting character which the prisoners are compelled to carry out for hours at a time and so for days weeks and months the same futile work the same futile and exhausting drill has to be carried out on food which is entirely inadequate ordinary prisoners can at least count the days to their release but the prisoners in concentration camps have no idea when they will be set free the barbarous treatment the prisoners receive the exhausting work and drill the low diet and the hopelessness of their position has driven many to suicide the politican correspondent who visited the hoiberg camp early in april nineteen thirty three reported that quote, captain buck answered my question quite willingly he admitted that attempts at suicide are not infrequent at this camp End quote. but there are also repeated cases which are officially reported as shot while trying to escape the falsity of such reports is obvious the camps are most closely guarded with armed patrols police dogs and searchlights at night the prisoner must realize the hopelessness of any attempt to escape and for that reason there are few real attempts to escape from the camps the murders in the camp however are systematically reported as shot while trying to escape dachau the murder camp fourteen cases of murder in the dachau camp near munich became known in the course of a few weeks in the middle of april the official wolf telegraph bureau reported quote, munich april fourteen w t v in the dachau concentration camp near munich communists made an attempt to escape the stormtroop police found themselves compelled to use their guns they brought down four communists of whom three were killed on the spot and one was mortally wounded End quote. according to the daily telegraph of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three the commandant of the dachau camp confirmed this report to the english journalist 
Geta. The names were not stated in the official announcement. The victims were described as communists, but it soon became known that they were not communists, but middle-class Jews. A prisoner who was in the Dachau camp describes the murder as follows. Quote, a few days ago we were going out as usual to work. All of a sudden the Jewish prisoners, Goldman, a merchant, Benario, a lawyer from Nuremberg, and the merchants, Artur and Erwin Kahn, were ordered to fall out of the ranks. Without even a word, some stormtroop men shot at them. They had not made any attempt to escape. All were killed on the spot. All had bullet wounds in their foreheads. They were buried secretly, no one being allowed to be present. Then a meeting was called, and a stormtroop leader made a speech in which he told us that it was a good thing these four Jewish sows were dead. They had been hostile elements who had no right to live in Germany. They had received their due punishment. End quote. We have particulars of thirteen similar murders at Dachau. Two of the most brutal cases were the murder of the communist members of the Diet, Dressel and Goetz. The former was tortured to death, and the latter was shot after weeks of brutal maltreatment. Tens of thousands in prison. The thirty-five to forty thousand prisoners in the concentration camps are not the only political prisoners in germany in addition there are the prisoners awaiting trial and those who have been sentenced to imprisonment and penal servitude their number is growing every day every day the press announces new mass arrests in the second half of june the number of new arrests was higher than in any previous period sometimes a thousand arrests are made in a day Thus, for example, in Seftenberg, a small town in the Niederlotzitzer coalfield, 267 Social Democrats have been arrested, in Bremen over 80, and several hundreds in Braunschweig, Hamburg, Saxony, Berlin, and Stuttgart, all on one day only. The total number of prisoners awaiting trial or already serving sentences can only be guessed at it is certainly not less than twelve to fifteen thousand the prisoners awaiting trial are herded together in overcrowded prisons sometimes four or five in a cell intended for a single prisoner many of the prisoners have no bedding of any kind among those awaiting trial are many well-known officials of the communist and social democratic parties as well as members of the democratic party the people's party the center party and even the german nationalist party ernst thalemann leader of the german communist party was arrested on march third in charlottenburg and put in prison in all the government papers and the press which have been brought into conformity it was reported that he had been arrested in connection with the reichstag fire the arrests it will be difficult for people in other countries to realize the arbitrary methods used by the police and storm troops in making arrests one day an illegal leaflet is seen in a street it is reported by a policeman or an adherent of the nazis police motors immediately rush up the whole district is cordoned off all houses are searched from attic to cellar books and typewriters are seized and often completely innocent citizens are carried off any obstruction is immediately met with violence and arrest every day the papers report such raids and mass arrests early in july the hitler government began to seize as hostages the relatives of workers who had escaped the best-known case is the arrest of five relatives of scheidemann but this is only one case among many. The Sentences The public prosecutors have been busy since February 27th. Special courts have been instituted in practically every German town. 
denunciations bring a continuous stream of prisoners and the charges are as arbitrary as the sentences often prisoners are kept for weeks in prison and then set free without even being tried but even after being set free they are continuously menaced with further arrest and in many cases have to report daily to the police the following are some examples of the nature of the charges and the heavy sentences passed Quote, the special court of moabit berlin sentenced the unemployed workers max ziegler and richard schrotter to fifteen months and eighteen months imprisonment respectively because ziegler a member of the communist party had distributed in east berlin illegally produced copies of the rotofana which he had received from schroter the darmstadt special court sentenced a female member of the young communist league to eight months and a male member to five months imprisonment for producing and distributing a leaflet the prisoners are sixteen years of age End quote. there are innumerable sentences for spreading atrocity stories often the relatives of arrested persons are told that they cannot expect the case to be heard for several weeks owing to the number of cases awaiting trial the relatives can seldom find a lawyer prepared to undertake the defense the position of the prisoners is made worse by the fact that the hitler government has prohibited the red aid organization which used to help the families of political prisoners but it still carries on its work with the help of similar organizations in other countries and the committees for the relief of the victims of german fascism which have been set up on the initiative of the workers international relief organizations end of chapter nine part two chapter ten of brown book of the hitler terror this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley. Chapter 10. Murder. Murder stalks through Germany. Mutilated corpses are carried out of Nazi barracks. The bodies of people disfigured beyond recognition are found in the woods. Corpses drift down the rivers. Unknown dead lie in the mortuaries. During the World War, lists were published of those who were killed the lists were even exchanged between enemy governments the hitler government is naturally not so liberal as to publish the list of all its victims only a small number of the murders ever appear in the press and then in the form of shot while trying to escape or in some similar lying form and if anyone were to try to get at the truth he would suffer the same fate torture and death on March 22nd, a general amnesty was proclaimed for all criminal acts committed in the fight for the National Revolution. This general amnesty is a license for all past and future murders. Hitler's Comrades of Potemper There is no complete list of the victims of Nazi knives and bullets, even in the months preceding Hitler's entry into the government. Certainly there must have been many hundreds murdered social democrats communists and members of the catholic parties as well as non-party workers a wave of murderous attacks on social democrats communists and members of the democratic parties developed in the first half of august 1932 in many towns these occurred on the same day showing clearly that they were organized in january 1933 under the schleicher government the number of crimes of violence perpetrated by national socialists rose very rapidly and after Hitler became Chancellor, they increased from day to day. In the first half of February, 27 working men and women were murdered by Nazi stormtroops. The most notorious case in the summer of 1932 was the murder of a worker in Potempa, a village in Upper Silesia. A murder gang of Nazis, who had first drunk heavily in an inn, forced their way into a house where a communist worker lived and literally trampled him to death in front of his aged mother. 
when all the bestial details of the crime had been disclosed in court and the death sentence had been passed on some of the criminals hitler openly came to their defence and in a letter described them as my comrades they were pardoned by the papen government immediately after march fifth nineteen thirty three that is even before the general amnesty these murderers were amnestied by hitler and again let loose upon the working class the murders and how they are hushed up as in all other sections of this book we rely in this chapter only on material which has been carefully checked up the main sources are accounts of eyewitnesses and reports published by the press in germany which has been brought into conformity these press reports not only reveal the murders but also show the methods used to hush them up methods which unintentionally often provide proof of the crime in the month of march nineteen thirty three reports of political murders still appeared in the press as a result of the initiative of the reporters but in spite of the fact that the only surviving newspapers had been brought into conformity so many reports of murders began to appear that they became dangerous for the hitler government in the course of april the reporting of murders was taken out of the hands of the press itself and even of the local censors appointed by the hitler government the following announcement was issued by the wolf telegraph bureau berlin second of april wolf telegraph bureau the government has advised all news agencies that reports on incidents in germany particularly reports on conflicts arising out of the jewish boycott must not be published without express sanction from the press department of the reich government no alteration of the wording of the report as passed for publication is permitted as a result of this centralization of the censorship a concrete picture of incidents is seldom given and if any details appear they are almost certain to be contradictory there are many ways in which the incidents are dealt with so as to conceal the true facts in the first place bodies found are said to be of unknown persons in most cases the police can immediately identify such bodies as the dead persons have already been reported as missing or as having been taken away by force but the reports do not disclose their identity secondly a great number of murders are represented as suicides the following report of the murder of councillor kresser of magdeburg shows how clumsily the truth is concealed magdeburg fourteenth march t u an incident resulting in bloodshed occurred late on sunday evening at felgeleben near magdeburg at an inn which had been used as a voting station the social democratic councillor kresser who arrived at the inn from magdeburg was taken into custody by the police officers there at the request of a number of storm troop men in another room an argument developed between kresser and a number of storm troop men in the course of which kresser fired a shot at the national socialists severely wounding the storm troop leader gustav Lehmann everyone ran out of the inn into which several shots were then fired from outside shortly afterwards kresser was found dead in the inn with a bullet through his head a post-mortem examination is now being carried out to establish whether kresser after his revolver attack put an end to his own life or whether he was killed by one of the shots fired into the inn from outside the national socialist party press has a tendency to make such reports as sensational as possible for example the volkischer beobachter of april twenty fifth presents one of the worst cases of lynching as suicide in the following terms terrible suicide smeared with tar and burnt a man living in a bungalow on the hona moor has committed suicide by a terrible method he went into the tool house built onto his bungalow where there was a barrel of tar after taking off some of his clothes he smeared himself with tar and set fire to the barrel he died in the fire which resulted the motive of the suicide was melancholia the bungalow was completely burnt down the suicide was a married man with several children the third method is to ascribe to natural causes deaths which take place in hospital as a result of nazi brutalities in a number of cases for example that of dr eckstein of breslau the report is used to slander the individuals after their death references to venereal diseases are made to discredit the victims the fourth method is to suggest that the motive of the crime was not political in such cases naturally no details of persons or motives are given as for example the following report published in germania of may fifteenth nineteen thirty three a police report states that on saturday evening hensler a slater 
was forced by several persons to accompany them to number twenty one lessingstrasse shortly afterwards the neighbours heard a number of shots hensler was found in the loft severely wounded and taken to hospital where he died within a short time the criminals escaped without being recognised the fifth method is the use of a formula which since the murder of karl liebknecht and rosa luxemburg has had a quite definite and unambiguous meaning the formula shot while trying to escape here is a typical case told in the officially published reports the frankfurter zeitung of april five publishes the following report from dusseldorf dated april four wolf telegraph bureau the communist leader bassler who has evaded arrest for a considerable time was located this morning by auxiliary police officers during the search the arrested man made use of a moment when he was not under observation to attempt an escape as he would not stop in spite of repeated warnings the officers made use of their weapons bassler was seriously wounded by a bullet and died after being taken to hospital the angriff of april five publishes the following message from dusseldorf dated april five the police state that on april four at about four p m the communist official bassler was arrested in his flat by protective corpsmen in the search of his flat two packets of dynamite were discovered documents were also confiscated on the way to the police station bassler made an attempt to escape he did not stop in spite of being summoned to do so several times and continued to run after warning shots were fired he was severely wounded by a shot in his back and died shortly after being taken to hospital in actual fact bassler's home was surrounded during the night he was brought out early in the morning and shot in the street the contradictions in the official reports are clear the dynamite was not found but invented reduction in the number of political murders the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of may sixth nineteen thirty three published the following under the heading great reduction in the number of political murders since the national government took power the following statement is official the prussian premier and minister of the interior goering announces through the chief of the secret police department that there has been a marked reduction since the national government took power in acts of violence with fatal results arising from political motives almost simultaneously with the taking of power by the national government the effective defence measures taken by the new government together with the relaxing of political tension as a result of the victory of the national movement brought about a rapid fall in the number of fatal cases which had previously been mounting steadily and has now reached its lowest point for a long time with only two fatal cases in april of this year at about the same time as the hitler government issued this transparent announcement it was also officially announced that during the month of april forty-six bodies had been brought to the berlin mortuary alone with their features mutilated beyond recognition during the month of april the fascist press itself reported fifty political murders the names being given in each case we now give details of a number of cases giving the sources of information in each case shot while trying to escape we have already quoted the reports published in the frankfurter zeitung and the angriff in connection with the death of heinz bassler bassler had been a member of the national socialists and a storm troop leader in december nineteen thirty he began to understand the real policy of the nazis and left the national socialist party later joining the communist party this was the reason why he was murdered the following letter shows how he was done to death if only our dear heinz was still alive i can't realize it but god will revenge this crime this crime was no german deed in the morning that is tuesday morning about four we were roused by seven protective corpsmen and two detectives we were kept quiet with revolvers heinz had to dress and go with them we had to lock the doors and were not allowed to open the windows oh god how roughly they treated our heinz they closed off the street as early as three o'clock and at four they came up and then they took him with them and they shot him in the street martial law oh what he must have suffered the poor lad i wish i had gone with him he had three shots through his heart one in his arm one in his neck one in his pelvis and two others besides eight shots in all then they left him lying there and some peasants found him like a dog i can't believe it 
I went running to Herr M. in the morning, for Heinz told me, go at once to him and tell him, for Weitzel has pledged himself to help me. But what help did he give? Heinz trusted people too much. Frau Lena, if you could have seen Heinz now on the death bier, you would have called God to judge. They had treated him so brutally. I can't forget what he looked like. How can anyone treat a poor, harmless human being so brutally? And then the lies in the newspapers, that Heinz had been shot while trying to escape, and that they had found two packets of dynamite. Such meanness. And it's not possible to get any justice done. Not even a pistol or a piece of paper of any importance did they find. And then the papers write such a provocation. But I call God in heaven to judge for such a cruel and mean crime. Everyone is so overwhelmed by this crime, they can't believe it, that these people should shoot down a person by himself, so mean and brutal. The funeral is Saturday afternoon at half-past one at the South Cemetery. Heinz will be buried by the clergyman, and many, many people will come with him on his last journey. When I went to Herr M., how he treated me, when I said to him, how can anyone shoot a helpless man like that, he answered, if you say much more, I'll have you arrested too. I'll shoot you down. About 6 p.m. on March 6th, Greta Messing, a working woman, married and with two children, left her home in the summer Mullenweg in Selb, Bavaria, and went towards the town to do some shopping. About 40 yards from her home, she met a national socialist of the name of Lager, who lived in the same street. He got in front of her and provoked her by saying, Heil Hitler. Frau Messing rejoined, rot front, and tried to pass him. Lager stopped her and threatened her with his revolver, saying, I'll shoot you down. She answered calmly, shoot away. Lager put his browning to the woman's throat and pulled the trigger. Frau Messing was mortally wounded. Her husband carried her back to her home, and there she bled to death. The murderer went to the Nazi inn, drank some liquor, and then handed himself up to the auxiliary police. He was put under arrest. Ten days later, he was released. A guard of honour met him at the station in Selb. Lager was not expelled from the storm troops. On the other hand, the husband and 19-year-old son of the murdered woman are in a Bayreuth penitentiary under protective arrest. Police and auxiliary police carried out repeated searches in working-class houses in Selb. They were not looking for a criminal, nor for a murderer, but for a photograph which was documentary proof of the murder. This photograph is printed here. Three Bodies in the Machnauer Forest On March 11, 1933, the whole press reported the finding in the Machnauer Forest of three bodies of young persons who had been shot, but whose identity was unknown. In spite of the fact that the police had all particulars, these were withheld from the public. The three youths were Fritz Nietzschmann, upholsterer, born at Oldenburg, March 1, 1909, then living in Berlin. His parents did not belong to any party, nor did he. Hans Balschkukat, a worker, born August 28, 1913, in Berlin, living in Berlin, member of the Red Aid Organization. Prouss, 23 years of age, living in Berlin. We have received the following information with regards to Fritz Nietzschmann. At 9.30 p.m. on March 8th, Nietzschmann was walking with his fiancée towards his home. When they reached the corner of the Stubenrach Erdmannstrasse, a red car came over the Siegfried Bridge and crossed to the left side of the empty street. Two men in stormtroop uniform, the chauffeur was in civilian clothes, jumped out of the car and came towards Nietzschmann and his fiancée, calling out, Halt! Stand still! You must come and have your papers examined. Nietzschmann said quietly, You must have made a mistake. To which the Nazis replied, Shut your mouth and get in. Nietzschmann did as he was told, as he felt that he had nothing to worry about. His fiancée, who also belongs to no party, wanted to get into the car with him, but was pushed roughly away by the Nazis, who told her that Nitschmann was only being taken to be identified, and that nothing would happen to him. His fiancée, who was crying after being pushed away, did not note either the number of the car or the number on the collar of the Nazis. The car drove through the Stubenrauchstrasse and turned into the Hauptstrasse. Immediately after his arrest, Nitschmann's fiancée went to his mother and told her what had happened. From there, she went to the police station in the Krimhildestrasse and stated the facts. There she was told, Nothing will happen to him. He will be back soon. Come again tomorrow. 
At 8 a.m. on March 9th, his mother went to the same police station and was told the same thing. She was, however, told that during the night, inquiries had been made at all police stations and that Nitchman had not been brought into any. She was to come again at noon. At noon, his father went to the police station and reported him as missing. Up to March 11th, Nitchman's parents heard nothing from the police. At 9 a.m. on that date, police officers arrived with the information that the Berlin Morgan Post had reported that three bodies had been found in the Machnauer Forest. From the description given, Nitchman's father thought that one of these must be his son, and he went to the police station where, however, he could not yet get any further information. At noon, the father went to the police headquarters and spoke to the inspector who was dealing with the case. The inspector, who did not then know that Nitchman had been carried off by stormtroop men, told the father that in all his experience he had never come across such a brutal murder. After the father had given all details, the inspector stated that he and his officers would do everything they could to discover the criminals. The father identified his son in the mortuary, in the presence of the inspector. The body showed ten bullet wounds, eight in the back, one in the neck, and one in the jaw. Permission to take a photograph of the body was refused. Cremation also was not allowed, in view of the possibility of expert examination being necessary. Up to March 15th, the criminal department had not yet authorised the handing over of the bodies to their families. Two persons independently approached Nitchman's father and gave the number of the car in which Nitchman had been carried off as IA78087. Both also stated that it was a red car. With regard to Hans Balschukat, the following information is in our possession. On March 8th, Balschukat was arrested at the entrance of Gottenstrasse 14 in Schonenburg by three National Socialists with drawn revolvers, who carried him off in a dark car. On March 10th, his father received a postcard with the following. I have today found a purse with contents. Please come for the purse on Saturday, March 11th at 6pm. Hans Schmidt, Bornstedt by Potsdam, Victoria Strasse 26. When the card arrived, Balschukat's father was not at home, and his mother took it to the police, who told her that she should not in any circumstances go to Bornstedt. At the same time, they telephoned to Bornstedt and to the detectives who were then investigating the crime in the Machnauer Forest. The purse was taken charge of by the criminal department. That same day, the father also went to the police, who told him that he must not go to Bornstedt, that the man who alleged that he had found the purse had already been arrested, as he was suspected of the crime, in view of the fact that the purse showed no sign of having been lying about. On March 11th, the father saw his son's body. He could not identify him at first, as the body was terribly disfigured. The lips were swollen and blue, the chin battered in, and there were blue patches on the neck and larynx and chest, apparently caused by violent kicks. The arms and chest had a number of swollen patches, which were evidently the result of the lad having been tied up. From the father's superficial examination, he was not allowed to examine the body carefully, the murdered lad had had six or seven bullets through him, two at the back of his head, one through his temple, two or three in his right arm, and a shot through his chest. No details can be secured with regard to the murder of Prouss, as his father refuses to give any information. Steel Rods and Spirits of Salt Groto Henne, a telegraph fitter, was a member of the Reichsbanner, but held no political office of any kind. On Monday, March 27th, he was visited by storm troop men, who insisted on his coming with them to the storm troop quarters. When he did not come home after some considerable time, Frau Groto Henne went to the storm troop quarters, and just as she was asking one of the Nazis to release her husband, Groto Henne was brought out into the street, little more than a bleeding lump of flesh. Several men brought him home. He complained of internal pains as well as external injuries. Groto Henne was able to tell what had been done to him. His clothes had been taken off, and he had been beaten with steel rods for three hours, from time to time being made to wipe the blood from the floor with his own clothes. When he was lying almost unconscious, the Nazis tried to pour spirits of salt between his clenched teeth. As they did not succeed in doing this, they then forced his teeth apart, tearing away a part of his upper lip in doing this. Groto Henne died on April 29th, after terrible suffering. An official post-mortem was held, and the cause of his death was certified as apoplexy and internal burns. 
the case was referred to the criminal department, but up to the present none of the criminals have been followed up. Beaten, stabbed, and trampled on. On March 28th, the communist Edom of Robert Strasser VI, Königsberg, was carried away from his home at midnight. As it was known that he was a friend of the communist Reichstag deputy Schutz, he was beaten for two hours in such a brutal way that he lost control of himself and told the Nazis where Schutz was living. At 2.30 a.m., Schutz was brought to the same Nazi barracks and there beaten, stabbed and trampled on for 12 hours. On the evening of March 29th, Schutz died in hospital, the cause of death being given as heart failure. On April 3rd, Schutz's body was put into the ground like a dog's. His death was not reported in any German paper. The doctors and nurses who had attended him were forced by threats to say nothing. In the meanwhile, Frau Schutz had been arrested. After her husband had been buried, she was compelled to sign an undertaking to say nothing of what had happened. The Nazis took Schutz's twelve-year-old son to see his father's mutilated body, and one of them said to him, You will have the same fate if you follow in his footsteps. Lynched in Prison the three following official reports on the case of Schum are enough to expose the methods used by the fascist news agencies. 1. Kiel 1, April, T.U. At about 11 o'clock, a dispute arose in front of the Jewish furniture shop kept by Schum, in the course of which the son of the Jewish shopkeeper attacked a protective cause man. When one of his comrades came to the latter's help, a fight developed between the two protective cause men and the shopkeeper who rushed up, and his son, in the course of which a shot was fired, which seriously wounded in the chest the protective cause man Walter Asthalter, 22 years old, of Kiel. The facts were as follows. In the course of the boycott of Jewish shops, a storm troop gang occupied the furniture shop kept by Schum. The shopkeeper was molested by the Nazis, and his son, a lawyer, tried to protect him. A dispute arose, and then a tussle, in the course of which a shot was fired by one of the Nazis, which seriously wounded another of the stormtroop men. 2. Kiel, 1 April, WTB. The son of the proprietor of the Schum furniture shop, who in the morning had fired some shots at a stormtroop man in front of his father's shop, and wounded him severely in the stomach, has been shot in the police cell to which he had been brought. It is reported that a number of persons went to police headquarters and demanded that the door of Schum's cell should be opened, and when this was not done, several shots were fired which killed him on the spot. The body was conveyed to the medical institute. This second report is already improved to make it appear that Schum, who was absolutely unarmed, had not only fired the shot, but some shots. The report gives the circumstances of the murder of Schum accurately enough, but without expressly stating that the Nazis concerned murdered him to get a witness of the morning's crime out of the way. But both of these reports were so transparent that that same afternoon the Central Press Bureau intervened and produced the following account, which is false in every particular. 3. Kiel, 1 April, WTB the Jewish lawyer and commissioner for oaths, Schum, at 11.30 this morning, shot a protective cause man of the name of Walter Asthalter in the stomach. According to information so far to hand, the shooting which took place in the Kiedenstrasse was without any plausible ground. The protective cause man died in the clinic. An enraged crowd of people assembled in front of the police jail, before the removal of Schum, which had been ordered by the authorities, could be effected. The enraged crowd forced its way into the prison where Schum was killed by revolver bullets. The whole incident developed so quickly that the police could do nothing to stop it. The crowd also forced their way into the shop kept by Schum's father in the Kadenstrasse and destroyed the stock. How the Mine Workers' Leader Albert Funk was murdered On April 16, the Mine Workers' Leader Albert Funk was recognised by a National Socialist in Dortmund and denounced to the police. Albert Funk had for many years played a leading part in the struggles of the mine workers. He was formerly a communist member of the Reichstag and leader of the United Mine Workers Union. Funk was put into the Dortmund police prison. He succeeded in getting out a letter reporting the terrible brutalities inflicted on seven other prisoners. He himself was not brutally treated at first. The papers said not a word about his arrest. This was enough to arouse the gravest fears. On April 26th, after ten days in prison, Albert Funk was murdered. His wife came to the prison to ask to see him, and was told that she could not, because he had poisoned himself in his cell. This was on April 28th. 
on the next day april twenty ninth the press of the Rohr district published sensational disclosures about alleged discoveries of arms dynamite dumps terrorist groups etc of the communists in the recklinghausen area and in this connection it was reported that the communist reichstag deputy albert funk who had been arrested had made an insane attempt to escape from the recklinghausen prison by jumping from the third floor window into the courtyard that he had broken his spine arms and legs that he had been taken fully conscious to hospital where he died shortly afterwards nothing was said about funk having been in prison for two weeks and naturally not a word of explanation was given as to how he was suddenly transported from dortmund to recklinghausen albert funk had been driven almost out of his mind by horrible tortures and his tormentors then forced him to throw himself out of the window when some of the murdered man's imprisoned comrades who were in the courtyard at the time cried out in horror the murderers shouted down to them you moscow swine can come and jump after him literally torn to pieces a witness reports early in march fritz gumpert of heidenau was arrested he was accused of having buried munitions and arms he was taken to the Königstein fortress and thence to the concentration camp at hohenstein there he was put in chains and tortured he was so appallingly ill-used that he died his wife was informed that he had died of internal hemorrhage workers in the heidenau factories collected money to bring the body to heidenau this was permitted but on the express condition that the coffin should not be opened the workers did not observe this condition none of the eyewitnesses will ever forget the sight gumpert's face had been completely torn to pieces as far as they could tell his tongue was missing traces of heavy chains were visible on his arms the back of the body was a lump of flesh that had been cut in pieces and was full of holes the spine was broken the sexual organs were lacerated the right thigh was torn open the pit of the stomach had been kicked in so that the intestines were protruding the lips showed how the victim had bitten into them to endure the appalling tortures he had suffered horrified and enraged workers gathered round and the stormtroop men used this as an excuse to confiscate the body again a number of police and doctors came up and a raid was conducted on the working-class houses in order to confiscate photographic apparatus and films all witnesses were threatened with the severest penalties if they spoke of the case those who were known to have seen the body were warned to keep their mouths shut on friday april twenty eighth the funeral took place some three thousand working men and women went to take part but all approaches were barred by storm troops armed with rifles when the cemetery gates were reached the nazis attacked the procession and only the relatives were allowed in the cemetery a clergyman wearing the swastika spoke at the graveside st bartholomew's night in Köpenick. in many german towns the nazi storm troops have carried out the night of the long knife foretold by hitler before his advent to power on the night of june twenty first to twenty second the nazis began a series of murders which lasted several days in Köpenick, a suburb of berlin the victims were officials of the social democratic party of the reichsbanner and of the communist party on june twenty first the storm troops twice searched the house of a trade union secretary schmaus in Köpenick. they stated that they were looking for arms during the night the storm troop men came a third time arrested schmaus's son-in-law who was a communist and then stormed the house firing a number of shots schmaus had a feeble-minded son twenty-two years of age who was wakened by the shooting picked up a revolver and went to oppose the nazis his mother shouted to him in alarm don't shoot but the son shot at and mortally wounded two of the nazis who had forced their way in then the slaughter began schmaus's son-in-law rakovsky was immediately shot by the nazis in front of the house schmaus's son was arrested and brutally done to death schmaus himself was hanged by the nazis in his house frau schmaus was accused of having told her son to shoot and was so brutally ill-used that she died a few days later that night marxists were arrested throughout Köpenick and friedrichshagen among them were the reichsbanner leader and former premier of mecklenburg johannes stelling the fifty-five-year-old paul von essen who was an official at the reichsbanner and Asmann, fifty-seven years of age who had been the reichsbanner leader in friedrichshagen a social democratic eyewitness gives the following account of what happened to the prisoners in the nazi barracks we were taken by car to the Köpenick prison the square in front was filled with stormtroop men who wanted to attack us as soon as they saw us the stormtroop leader however shouted stop 
Don't hit them in the street. But we were hardly inside the building when they began to attack us. We were driven up the stairs and along a long passage. In a long cell there were ten comrades standing with their faces to the wall. The floor and wall were already spattered with blood. An old woman with blood streaming from her mouth and nose and her clothes spattered with blood was forced to scrub the floor. One of the storm troop men asked me, Do you know this whore? I looked at her more closely and saw with horror that she was my wife's mother. Then the Nazi told Comrade Kaiser to strike another comrade in the face. When Kaiser hesitated, he hit him such a blow with his fist that he went staggering to the wall. Then the comrades were forced with blows from sticks to hit each other until they were bleeding. After that, we had to run the gauntlet about ten times through lines of storm troopmen armed with sticks and truncheons. In the course of this, some of the older comrades collapsed. Meanwhile, the fifty-five-year-old Paul von Essen was brought in, and the Nazis greeted him with howls of joy. He had been unemployed for a long time and had just come out of hospital. He was blind in one eye. He took part in the war, and he had four children. The first hit him in the face, then pulled down his trousers and beat him with really insane fury, with sticks and truncheons, until he lost consciousness. Comrade von Essen has since succumbed to the terrible injuries his torturers inflicted on him. Then we were each taken to a cell and beaten. The brutalities were repeated regularly every hour. Finally, I was taken to the leader for examination, and in my despair I denied that I was a Marxist. He then ordered that I should not be beaten meanwhile, but if it turned out that I had told a lie, I was to be shot. Shortly afterwards the door of my cell was flung open, and a storm troop leader rushed in with other storm troop men and beat me, shouting, You scoundrel, we'll finish you off today. I was then dragged along the passage to my mother-in-law's cell, and while two of the Nazis held me, the old woman, who was fifty-three years of age, was beaten with sticks until she lay quiet on the floor. She is now out of her mind and in an asylum. This eyewitness did not recognize either Stelling or Asman among the prisoners. Some days later, Stelling's body, covered with wounds and sewn up in a sack, was taken out of the Finnov Canal. At the same time, two other unknown bodies were recovered. Eleven other men were missing. On July 12th, people in Friedrichshagen heard that Asman's body had also been found. And so, also throughout Germany, at the time when Hitler was more and more openly acting on behalf of the rich capitalists of Germany, the number of murders was rising. End of chapter 10 Chapter 20 of Brown Book of the Hitler Terror This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley Chapter 11 The German Workers' Fight Against Fascism On April 21st, 1933, the German Press Bureau of Stuttgart issued the following. Although the seizure and confiscation of all communist printed papers was ordered as far back as March 1st, communist sheets are still circulating. On April 28th, the British Press Bureau of Berlin stated, In the course of the search a considerable quantity of printed matter and numerous stencils for the production of leaflet material for May 1st were found at Stiglitz in Friedenau. That the attempt to stop the organization of the anti-fascist fight had not succeeded is shown by the following announcement made by the Police Press Bureau of Kassel on May 5, 1933. In continuation of the measures taken against the illegal district leadership of the German Communist Party in Kassel, Early on Thursday morning, the political police carried out searches in secret offices and in the houses of the leaders of the district committee. On May 26, 1933, the Bremen police announced that, in spite of the police warning issued a few days ago in connection with the distribution of illegal communist sheets and the reference to the severe penalties attached on Thursday evening, the illegal Arbiter Zeitung, six pages in size, was circulated by the communists. Hitler aimed at carrying out the destruction of all political parties. 
but there is one party that he cannot destroy the german communist party which is carrying on the fight against fascism illegally the statements issued by the hitler government are every day proving that the party's active opposition cannot be broken reports are coming in from every part of germany showing that groups of workers belonging to the social democratic party and to the reichsbanner the league of socialist youth and the christian organizations are joining with the communists in the fight in the days following the burning of the reichstag anti-fascist sheets issued by the communists were already circulating among the workers workers homes and the cellars and roofs of blocks of flats were transformed into secret printing works although hundreds of active agitators were arrested thousands of newly trained and determined workers took their place in spite of the extension of torture and ill-treatment the fight for freedom against fascism continued even more vigorously and with increasing effect each line of the illegal papers issued by the communists is literally written in blood new horrible acts of torture were perpetuated wherever each issue of these papers appeared before the end of march an illegally printed pamphlet on the burning of the reichstag was produced and was distributed in every part of germany its external appearance is that of the advertisement of the film in the sign of the cross goring the organizer of the reichstag fire was compelled to pay a glowing tribute to the disintegrating work carried out by the communists when at the end of june nineteen thirty three he dissolved the organization of young german nationalists on the official ground that it had been completely permeated by communists early in july the threatening statements issued by hitler and frick against the second revolution showed that the work of unmasking the hitler government was achieving success even among large numbers of the storm troops and of the national socialist factory cells the following pages give only a brief and partial statement of the underground work which is being carried on in germany the illegal rotafana one of the most vital sections of the fight against fascism is the production and distribution of illegal newspapers. The Rotafana, the central organ of the German Communist Party, has been appearing regularly since the burning of the Reichstag. Police activities, raids, the allocation of thousands of spies, nightly patrols of stormtroop men through printing works have been unable to prevent the production of this paper it continues to appear as a two or four page paper and to find its way into the blocks of flats in wedding into the aeg and simon's factories and into the railway stations though the technical production of the paper may be worse than before it is certain that none of its former issues have ever been read by so many people as the present issues the christian socialist paper reichspost issued in vienna on may twenty seventh printed the following interesting story at first the rotafana appeared in an illegally printed edition of three hundred thousand copies and this was followed by a number of duplicated editions secret presses previously prepared for such purposes duplicating machines and typewriters began their work soon the greater part of the local cell and industrial papers though most of them only duplicated were again in circulation and hundreds of thousands of leaflets were being passed from hand to hand in the factories and at the labor exchanges in twenty different areas in greater berlin in addition to the printed rotafana duplicated papers produced from wax or metal sheets are regularly distributed weekly experienced long before the hitler dictatorship was and sometimes twice weekly they all bear the heading rotafana these papers are edited by workers red papers throughout germany early in may the hamburg police announced that in spite of the strongest countermeasures taken by the authorities again and again treasonable publications of the communist party of germany 
and particularly papers such as the prohibited hamburger volkszeitung and other marxist productions are being produced and sold on the streets in the ruhr district the ruhr echo has appeared several times in large editions the may first number was even printed in two colours in essen although whole districts of the town have been searched through by storm troops and police and although courageous distributors of the papers have been most horribly tortured duplicated editions of the ruhr echo continue to appear a letter received from a munich worker reports that every week a hectographed newspaper is issued in an edition of three thousand copies immediately after its production it is distributed to the separate anti-fascist groups and brought by them to the workers in a number of different ways six reichsbanner groups are helping in the distribution the bremen police refer to the illegal six-page paper the arbiter zeitung in stuttgart the south german arbiter zeitung appears in printed form and illegal papers were also distributed in leipzig and frankfurt am main during april and may several numbers of the dusseldorf journal freiheit were distributed in mannheim several issues of the rote fahne badens have been published in erfurt the thuringer volksblatt appears in duplicated form in the factories the only party which had made preparations for carrying on underground activities in the factories was the communist party its members were already established in the secret production and distribution of factory papers and because of this experience it had been possible for numbers of such papers to be distributed in the factories during the period of the hitler dictatorship for example a worker in the aeg works in berlin reports as follows in the anti fastici front of july second nineteen thirty three our last leaflet appeared in a format ten by twenty centimeters we produced it in the following way we first worked out the slogans and cut them in linoleum then we put the strips of linoleum over an inked bladder and printed off copies one by one during the night we posted a great number of these copies on various gates of the factory and we scattered the remainder in the streets round our fellow workers who are really starving for material of this kind picked up the leaflets as they came back to work in the morning and showed great enthusiasm each single leaflet passing through dozens of hands the illegal papers hofentel and grammy funkspruck and der storm are being published in the port of hamburg from one hamburg office it is reported that the rolls of paper in the closets contain small leaflets or cuttings from illegal papers in the siemens works of spandau berlin anti-fascist youth workers have up to now succeeded in producing their paper regularly in the bielfeld works the rote wacht is being produced and distributed by a joint group of communist social democrats and reichsbanner workers lightning demonstrations during the months of march april and may there were large and small anti-fascist demonstrations in hundreds of places most of them took the form of so-called lightning demonstrations in such demonstrations the workers assemble at an agreed point at a given signal carry out a demonstration lasting only a few minutes shouting slogans against the hitler dictatorship and singing anti-fascist songs these demonstrations as a rule succeed in dispersing again before the police or storm troops are able to intervene these mobile methods are adopted to prevent a large number of arrests during april such demonstrations were held in addition to very many others of which we have no reports in remscheid cleve krefeld siegen stetten worms osterode dusseldorf and linden near hanover a report from hamburg states that early in may the young communist league distributed ten thousand printed leaflets posted up eighty posters prepared by hand 
and painted anti-fascist slogans on walls and pillars in every part of the town four lightning demonstrations were held in each of which an average of three hundred workers took part a danish anti-fascist reports that during a visit to germany he saw a street choir of four workers who suddenly shouted who set fire to the reichstag the nazis and then separated and disappeared early in march a streamer was found across a working-class street in dortmund bearing the words nero set fire to rome and put the blame on the christians hitler set fire to the reichstag and blames the communists the same slogan printed from a linoleum cut was posted on walls all over dortmund at the end of april the Vosichi zeitung of may third reports the wolf telegraph bureau reports from barnau that the night of april thirtieth may first a red banner bearing a hammer and sickle was fastened to the top of the steeple of the marrying kirk early in the morning of may first it was taken down by storm troop men at the risk of their lives that morning which was the festival of national labor nazis who went to hoist the swastika banner at the town hall discovered that it had been stolen during the night the excitement in barnau arising from this double act of provocation was indescribable during the night of may first second about forty suspected persons were arrested by the storm troops and police and removed to the concentration camp at oranienburg in addition to torture and murder starvation is used by the hitler government as a method of fighting the anti-fascists the following quotation from the frankfurter zeitung of may tenth nineteen thirty three illustrates the methods used in the attempt to force the unemployed to denounce anti-fascist agitators kassel may eighth in schmuckelden which is in the administrative district of kassel intensified communist propaganda among the unemployed have been in evidence during the last few days several communist leaflets have been distributed and their producers and distributors have not yet been discovered the mayor of schmuckelden has therefore ordered that relief is to be withheld from all recipients who are of the left tendencies until the criminals have been caught anti-fascists who are charged before the courts are not allowed witnesses or any other opportunities of defense before the charge is heard the penalty has already been decided on but in spite of everything many of the accused have made a heroic stand in court against the fascist dictatorship a report from altona dated june second nineteen thirty three for example states that during the trial of twenty anti-fascist workers the communist worker lutgens against whom the government attorney demanded the death penalty stated that he regarded this demand put forward by the prosecution as an honor as there could be no higher honor for a revolutionary worker than to be sentenced to the death penalty by a capitalist class court and prison clothes were robes of honor in the middle of may a typist fraulein jure was sentenced to imprisonment for eighteen months for having passed on leaflets the berlin journal der tag reported that the accused stated in court that she still remained loyal to communist ideas to which prosecuting counsel replied attention must be called to the audacity and shamelessness displayed by communists who dare to proclaim their views even here in front of the special tribunals similar cases are reported from all parts of germany only a very small percentage of the sentences passed on anti-fascist agitators is ever reported in the press but the increasing severity of the sentences has done nothing to stop the anti-fascist work which is being carried on unceasingly it has only been possible within the limits of this book to give a few examples of this work the organization of political and economic strikes 
the hundreds of separate movements within the factories and the results in the compulsory labor camps must be left to the second volume of the brown book the story of the heroic stand made by anti-fascists in the struggle for german freedom has still to be written the story of fighters who stood their ground in spite of the menace of murder the story of prisoners who met the death sentence with a proud declaration of their loyalty to socialism the story of tortured victims who sang the international in spite of steel rods and truncheons the story of heroes like the teacher wilhelm hamann in hessen who was ordered to raise the swastika banner and shout long live the leader of the german people adolf hitler but who hurled the banner to the ground and amid the blows of the storm troop men shouted long live the revolution and comrade thalman tens of thousands of nameless heroes are fighting to free germany and the world from the shameful barbarism of the brown shirts they are facing courts martial and the gallows torture and concentration camps their loyalty and courage cannot be broken and their ceaseless activity is fanning the spark which will burst forth into the flame of socialist freedom End of section 20 chapter 11